Welcome to Soar Mag's Writer's Cafe, where we share the real writer's life over a cup of friendship, sprinkles with laughter and wisdom. My name is LaShonda Hoffman, and I'm your host. This episode's sponsor, Building Your Readership by LaShonda Hoffman, a new Kindavella book. Are you ready to become a social butterfly? Inside this new episode book, LaShonda shares 10 ways to start building your readership. Increase your book sales as you learn how to be consistent with your book promotion. Each episode includes action steps to implement to help you become a social butterfly. Check the show notes for the link. Today, sitting at the cafe with me is Ms. Jacqueline Walker. Welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to have you. All right, so Jacqueline is going to share a little bit about who she is, what she writes, and hopefully we'll get a sneak peek of her current book. On you now, Ms. Jacqueline. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Jacqueline P. Walker, and I'm an inspirational writer. I dabble in both fiction and nonfiction. <clears throat> I was born in, on the island of Jamaica, but raised in Washington, D.C., and I attended Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York. I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, and I spent some 30 years in corporate America holding different positions in project management and business communications. I'm a certified professional technical communicator, and currently I work um, nine to five as a documentation manager. Um, But I've had a lifetime love for reading and writing, and growing up in a large family, uh, I really recognized the power of storytelling to really share, educate, encourage, and entertain, and that really motivated me to um, start writing inspirational and encouraging blogs. And I did uh, that for years, um, writing for Everyday Power blog. And then um, I also, from my enjoyment of reading and writing, I, in many years I would write, you know, personal poetry for my family, etc. And then I moved into actually writing books, and I wrote a a book of personal essays some years ago. Um, It was just a hobby, something for me to really try to do and get into. But then as that really grew on me, I wanted to do more. And so this year I self-published a season of disruption, which is both is a mix of fiction and nonfiction because it is a a biographical um, fictional memoir, and it is a um, a book that really celebrates my Caribbean heritage and tells a story of courage, love, and ingenuity, and the willpower to overcome challenges um, that can sometimes often break and defeat families. So, uh, a A Season of Disruption, as I said, is a fictional memoir, and it is based on a specific slice of time in my family's life. And it was really a time when tragedy came in and threatened not just our future and our dreams and our goals, but, you know, really everything that our parents wanted for us. It threatened our, our overall survival and sustenance. And the story is primarily set in Jamaica, where we are from and where we lived at the time. And the triggering event um, was my father's death, which left my mother widowed with five children. And my mother made um, somewhat of an unimaginable decision to leave her children and not just leave them with someone because, really, she couldn't find anyone to take five children in. So she left five children alone. Um, They were between the ages of 15 and 8 to grow up on their own um, while she took a chance to try to find a way to make a better life with the hopes. Her hope was in reuniting her family as quickly as she could. But the book takes the reader on two paths, and it takes down the path of story of these five children left alone, living alone with the 15-year-old in charge as the guardian and how they manage to strive and survive. And at the same time, it takes down the path of the mother now navigating 
a new country with new traditions and new ways and um, just a whole lot more to learn as well as trying to find a way to reunite and bring her family together the way she really wants it to be. And so in, in going through that story, it details not just her perseverance but her willpower and her craftiness in actually um, taking risk and coming up with a plan of action in the hopes of affecting that reunion that she wants with her children. So that just gives you a background of the book. Ooh, that sounds really interesting. Really interesting. Thank do you do you want to read your excerpt? Sure. Let me read a a, a short passage. And this passage. Um, kind of sets the, the, the scene with the, trigger, the triggering event that I spoke of. And so it begins, um, I remember the day this challenging season began in our family, the day disruption knocked at our door. It was 1970 in Kingston, Jamaica. A small island in the Caribbean Sea, Jamaica was still growing after gaining its independence a mere eight years earlier. New communities were popping up, and families were buying or building houses to create stability and define legacies. The economy was growing from tourism, manufacturing, and a flourishing bauxite, a natural rock used in many aluminum products, industry. Political and social uprising were minimal because the economy was stable, and generally, many families were satisfied with their ability not merely to survive, but to live a comfortable life. Also, there were not many incidences of government and legal corruption or abuse. We lived in a housing development that was less than 10 years old. When we moved there five years earlier, there were no schools and supermarkets, just in-home stores run by a few private residents with minimal supplies. We had a variety of vegetables and fruits that grew in our backyard, mango, lime, callaloo, banana, coconut, and we even had a chicken coop from which we gathered fresh eggs. Our daily routines were not extraordinary. We went to school, performed our assigned chores, played in the yard, and attended church every Sunday morning. Life was excellent. As they see on the island, no problem, man. Up to that point in my life, I had no problems. But early one Sunday morning in March 1970, disruption came along to challenge our routine. About four months after my eighth birthday, my family experienced unforeseen changes that would shape our future. That morning, I got out of bed as I heard the rooster crow. Like most Sunday mornings, the neighborhood was quiet. Sundays were indeed a day of rest. Most people slept in and ventured out only for church services. Since everyone, if, since everyone was typically asleep or inside their houses, the rooster's crow was loud and clear as it was the only sound that traveled from outside to inside. But this morning inside our house seemed eerily quiet. I did not think that I was the only one up although the others may have slept in since we did not expect to go to church as we usually did. Mother had spent most of the previous day and all night at the hospital because Daddy had been admitted after being hit by a motorcycle. Before Mother had left for the hospital that evening, she told us she did not know what time she would be home. So we were unsure of whether we would attend church on Sunday morning. Mother's reluctance to give us a specific time that she would be home should have set off an alarm with us, but we were kids, and up until then, our lives had been happy and routine, so we never expected anything bad to happen. I heard voices in the carport, so I walked through the kitchen and headed in that direction. I saw my brothers, Champa and Kamir, but I did not need them. I was looking for my sister, Faith. Because I was getting hungry, and my sisters usually saw to my every need when mother was not around, I turned around to head back inside. I knew Hope, my eldest sister, was not home. She accompanied mother on her trip to the hospital. But where in the world was Faith? I don't know why I was surprised, because she always moved to the beat of her own drums. I walked through the living room toward the front of the house. 
that's when I heard it. A car pulling up to our home and screams breaking the silence. Well, I would found one of my sisters and it wasn't faith. It was hope. He's dead. He's dead. She moaned and hollered all at the same time. I remember my body shaking and I suddenly felt cold. My head started pounding at the same time and I couldn't fully understand what she was saying, although I heard her loud and clear. Instinctively, all my eight-year-old self knew to do at that moment was cry, and that is what I did. As the tears streamed down my face, I ran towards the front door. I opened the door just as my uncle's car pulled up into the carport. My mother Myrna and my sister Hope exited, both sobbing in sadness. By then, my eyes were overflowing with tears and my head was spinning. I didn't know what to say or what to do. I remember Hope hugging me, and then I saw a champ, Khmer, and Faith coming from inside the house to see what was going on. I thought it was a dream. It seemed like a bad dream, and I wanted to wake up from it. But sadly, it was not. I'd heard what my sister screamed from the car, so I knew it was official. Daddy was gone forever. So that just sets the triggering event that then the story builds from. Wow. I, um, my, my first question for you was, were you the oldest, but you were the baby? Yes, so, I was the baby. <laughs> so you're telling this from your point of view, the, the eight-year-old's point of view? Yes, I'm telling it from my point of view, from my remembrance, my experience, and um, I, again, my remembrance also of what was told to me. Okay, okay, that that, wow. So you are you using your family's real name? No, and that's why I, I have it set as a fictional memoir because I did not that's use. Not really. <laughs> Right. I changed the, the family names and I changed a few like the city names, but everything in this story that I've told is um, uh, uh, true and accurate. <laughs> okay, that's why I was wondering because you said it, the, the key word here was fictional. And I was like, yes. hmm, how, how does your family feel about the book? Did they read it? My family has read the book and I mean, they, they, they have got really good response and feedback. I, okay. I, it really took them back because it's been as a, 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 like 50 years, and mm -hmm. you know a lot of times you don't think about the, the 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 events all together. You knew what happened and you just went on with life. But this book kind of made them sit and 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 look at the entire episode and kind of relive it. And so um, it has been a good experience, and I think especially also for the, not just for us who experienced it, but for the next generations, for them to learn and hear about, you know, what we experienced, what we went through, and how their legacy was built. <laughs> mm -hmm. It sounds really interesting because I'm, I'm just thinking about my mom died when I was 48. Ah. Uh, my dad, my dad died um, in 2019. So ah. um, I, I'm listening to you, and I'm, I'm thinking, how would an eight-year-old Lashonda handle that? Because the 48-year-old and the 50-some-year-old when was really hard. <laughs> 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 you know, and I'm like, see, you know, you've seen death through an eight-year-old. Most people, when we, uh, I talk about grief a lot because when mm -hmm. my mom died, I was not prepared. Grief wise, nobody prepares you for grief. Right. And I'm, li I'm, li I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, man, that had to be a story that's uh, very hard to write because as an eight year old, you're learning what death is. You know, at 48, I had experienced death a couple of times. So I knew what death was, but I still didn't understand it because I hadn't sat on the front pew. So you were sitting at the, on the front pew because that's your dad. That's the, the person who gave you life, you know, and you got to deal with that. Um, and in horror, it's hard, uh, grief, people don't talk to children about grief. And so right. I'm like, I'm listening to you, I'm like, man, it had to be hard to revisit that because you had to go back into your eight-year-old self and, and feel that pain all over again. And then you all had a change in your, complete change in your life because your mom had to go too. 
she had to go somewhere and leave you there. And I don't, I know I got to read the book to find out how long she was gone, but I'm just thinking, oh my God, that you're going through this grief and the person that you need to be there with you to give you the comfort isn't there. Right. Yeah. Everything changed. Oh You're right. Goodness. Everything changed in our lives from that event. Yeah. From that event happened, um, within months she was gone, and we were now on a new journey. Yeah, because I had to feel like almost a second grief because you didn't know how long she's going to be gone or if she might even come back, you know. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine that as an 8-year-old trying to uh, go through all that. And I know I, I was the babysitter of our house, so I was the one who could and stuff when my mom my mom had to do things or she had to work late or she couldn't, you know. And so um, kids never listen to you. So I know y'all gave your hope the blues. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, some more so than others. That's the thing, some yeah. more so than others. But um, as, I, as I lay out the story and even as I look at it now, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. and, I, I, and that's why I try to point out, um, hope and my older sister and guardianship because it was int- as I look back I was like she was wise beyond her years mm-hmm. and, and had a strength and courage beyond her years because looking back I'm like how did she do that at 15 wanting to be a 15 year old as you read the book you'll see she was still a 15 year old so there's things she did as a 15 year old that 15 year olds would do um, mm-hmm. but still the, for the most part she was I need to do this and set, you know, and guide and be a guardian and set certain standards and, you know, and, and protect them until my mother can get this together. So, um, so you kind of see both sides of a 15-year-old, who, I won't give the story of who did some things that, okay, a 15-year-old would do, and then the other side of, is she really 15? <laughs> Well, I've got so many questions because I'm like, hey, I got to read this book because I'm just, I'm like, how did she keep you guys together without y'all getting separated, you know? And I'm like, oh my goodness, I just can't even imagine that. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's we as a parent, being a parent is so hard because you have so many decisions that you have to make to keep your children safe. You know, to make right. sure that you can provide for them and to have to leave a country. She left her country to go somewhere else. Had to be one of the hardest decisions she made in her life, you know, pertaining to her children. You know, but you guys are here, so I, it worked out. I know it worked out. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 uh, yeah, we're here, so we know it worked out. But as you mm-hmm. said, that was the challenge for her of going to a new country, one, dealing with, you know, uh, a, a whole new society and the way things are done, but also she had been for uh, pretty much for 16 years for all her adult life, pretty much had been a housewife. You know, she was married at 18 and okay. had been a housewife up until her husband, the breadwinner, suddenly dies. And yeah, so now she provide when that exactly was now she's she has to become the provider in some way, shape, mm-hmm. or form. Mm-hmm. Oh and she goodness. has to do it in a new country, and she has to learn that way. And in a, and and in coming to you know she has that goal, and that goal is, I am coming, and I need to be a provider. But really, my goal is is being a provider plus get in my children so that I can set a, a, a brighter future for them. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, she ran into a, a lot of different roadblocks, you of know, course. And, course. and delays and how is this going to get done and um, was almost, you know, in despair of this is never going to get done. And then she and, – and, and that is – uh, kind of what I wanted to bring out in the book, I, I want to inspire people and women and, you know, and single mothers about to say, you know, it's within you and you can find that thing within you when, when all it looks like it's not going to work out, that you can find within you and be strong, courageous, and faithful and, and, and sometimes take a chance, an unmanageable chance that people don't think that you should take because when you read the book, you'll see what she did and the chance she took to get it to work out the way she needed it to work out to get her children. Yeah, because she, so if you're coming to the here, you're almost like 
you are considered an immigrant, right? You, yeah, so you I mean, yeah, it's definitely. She came here. She's an immigrant. And I'll tell mm-hmm. you that she came as an immigrant on a visa that was stamped for six months and six months only. Oh, okay, because I was just going to say, did she come in here legally? That was really right. makes you happy. Right. No, she, she came right. in legally. Her, her okay. mom had my grandmother all had lived in New Jersey. And okay. so she arrived legally, but she had a six-month visa, and she had a six-month visa to try to, hey, and somehow I have to not only get this to go longer, I have to then, after that, try to find a way then to also get um, true visas for my children. Yeah. And, and yeah. that wasn't and that wasn't like, okay, come I work and here it is, it's done. It, <laughs> no. Oh, I, I have been I have a I've gotten really interested in, in immigration and how it works and it's just like it's they make it so difficult for people you wonder why people are here illegally because you make it. You got so many hoops you got to jump through to get in, right. and then you got the, and then it's a financial part that you have to pay. And most people are barely hanging on by the thread, you know. So exactly. No, you're you're about. very you're very right. You're very you're right. And 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 and, and, yeah. and the hoops that you have to go through and the um and, you know and, and and I'm not knocking the system because it is necessary. Um to make sure things are right. And it is necessary um, to make sure that you are vetting the process. So I have no issue with, with any of that. Um, mm-hmm. But I just take you through in the book the, 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 the experience, I think, of a lot of Caribbean mothers who I don't think my mother was the only one who, who came with that, you know, a temporary path, so to speak, and then had to find a way to get it into a permanent um, state and that road is a very difficult road and that's the road that my mother who had had no no experience no work experience no um, per se special and marketable skill and to that no higher education had to now be wise enough and crafty enough to craft a plan that could get her that legal state that she needed, plus get her children and get them in some sort of a legal state. And, and, and it's just inspiring and encouraging to show that she did it and to me inspire others that they can do it too or work through other situations of the sort. Oh, I'm so excited that you wrote your mom's story because it's, it's a very important story, especially in this time of immigration. It's just, it's, you know, they just, oh, I just don't like the way it's set up. I, 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 I wish it was a little more easier process, you know, especially when it happens with children, you know. Right. Like, um, you're trying to make a better life for your kids. You, you know, it's a different thing as you trying to bring some adults over here just all the time. Right. But you're trying mm-hmm. to bring children and bring, make it a better world for them. And so I, uh, I commend her for taking that step. And doing it, I look. I joined the Navy at 18, so I went to a foreign country to myself. I went to Guam. I had never heard of wow. Guam in my life, so I can't even imagine coming to another whole country. And you know, I was in Guam for 18 months, but the people spoke what I spoke. I knew I could, you know. It was, mm-hmm. You know, I had I had a job. You you know, we take stuff so much for granted, you right? Know, because that's just how we live. You know, cause, but I'm just thinking, man, what if I went to a country that they spoke, you know, they spoke Spanish and I couldn't speak Spanish. I just went there and I got a job and I, you know, I don't know anybody. Right. I'm by myself. And then I left my family. I, I miss my family a lot. I was in Guam and at that time we didn't have cell phones. You know, we didn't have phones. So I had exactly. to pay, <laughs> I paid every two weeks, every pay period. I, I called my mother and it was like $50 to talk to my mother for an hour. And I mean, I got my whole 60 minutes. <laughs> you know, talking to my mom and crying and telling them I missed them because they wasn't. That was my first time being away from home. So I oh, can't even. I just, I, my heart aches for her because I know it had to be devastating to be away from your children. She probably couldn't even call you guys and talk to you. And no, you. I think during that period there might have been one phone call because, again, oh as you said, goodness. the cost. Plus, really, at that time in Jamaica, in our home, we did not have a phone. Yes, so, I'm thinking that, too. I'm thinking maybe you didn't have a phone. Was exactly. she able to write to you guys? Did she write to you? Yeah, so she, and that was it, you know, waiting for the mail to come through. (laughs) Yeah, 
Well, I'm, I'm thinking how I'm thinking about all the stuff that I had to do in another country. Another, well, it wasn't. It was in, well, it was another country to me. That's how I felt. <laughs> it was an island, but you know, I'm thinking I live for my mail. I live for yes. <laughs> contact from my family because I wasn't yes. able to call anybody. So I'm, you know, I was at the mail. Me and the mailman was we was buddies. He would say, "Hey, hey, you got a box today? <laughs> hey, let's shot then you got some mail." You know, Christmas time was probably one of the best times for me. Because people told me the whole time I was there that I was that Christmas is the worst holiday when you buy yourself. Because I was by myself. I didn't have a boyfriend. I was just by myself. Oh yeah. You know, so um, you know they're like you got and I I my family was a Christmas family. We my mother decorated. We had oh yes, us so too. Christmas. And so I was really miserable for Christmas. And somebody one of the little ladies she was leaving and she said, "Would you like my baby Christmas tree?" And she had this little tiny tree, what I call it, my little Charlie Brown tree. And I was like, yeah. And I went to the base and I got these decorations and stuff. And I put on the tree and I told my mom about my tree for Christmas. Oh. <laughs> yeah, see, but that makes a difference. Yeah, and, well, everybody kept telling me it was going to be the worst Christmas I ever had. And I, to this day, it was one of the best Christmas I ever had. My mother sent me three big boxes. And when I got to the mailbox, the mail to the post office, the Mailman said, "I need you to go get you three men to come over here to your mother." Your your oh, mother. Oh wow! Sister. I said three men. He's like three. You need three men. I said, "Okay." My mother sent three big boxes. Three big boxes. One box was Christmas goodies, cookies, candy, whatever, for, and decorations for my little baby tree. The second <laughs> box, and the other two boxes was presents. She said, "Everybody in my family sent me a present, so I got presents oh, for my wow. mom and you know." And then they they made a Christmas video. I mean, I cried for the whole weekend. <laughs> oh, God, see, that's a great memory. That was the best, one of the best Christmases ever. And I, everybody that told me that my that my Christmas was going to be horrible when I was in the military because, you know, that they had families that didn't do that. Yeah, and so right. I went and got them, and I brought them up to my room, and I said, I want you to see my Christmas my mother gave me. Oh. <laughs> and they were like, then they all calling their parents. What's up with that guy? Yeah, he ain't sending no card right now. <laughs> you know, but I, I can't imagine being away from your family. Like, I know how I felt as a single person, and I didn't have children. Mm-hmm. I can't even imagine the pain your mom went through. And she probably didn't talk about it because she didn't want to upset you guys. But, oh, my goodness, I, I just want to hug her and tell her, oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it, it was. I want to hug I, you guys because I'm not. That was, it had to be horrible, a horrible time. But you're little. You don't really know it's a horrible time until later on. You know, right now you guys exactly. are probably just, you're, exactly. you're grieving your dad and you're grieving your mom, but you're still kids, so you're just going on with life. You exactly. know, and my mother always said, you just keep on living. So I'm, I'm, I am so looking forward to finding out how you guys survived your time away from your mother and how she became a superwoman because that's what she did. She became a superwoman and made it happen for my, like my Yeah, kids, she say, became, my mom, my definitely in my <laughs> eyes, that's exactly what she became. But, yes. but as I said, you know, I really want it. I really want others to see that they can do this or 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 or, or, or overcome their own challenges, whatever they are. Yeah, she made a miracle happen. She made my kids used to always tell me, "Mom, you know, when you think you're doing the worst thing for your child, your child will come and tell you, Mama, that was the best time.' We we right. You know, <laughs> you know, and you're like right. crying because you're, you know, I'm away from my kids, and and you, but you guys probably have some sweet memories from that time. It's not all bad, you know. And, no, and no, and I, and that's and that's why um in the book, like I say in the book, I, I take you down two paths because I'm I'm mm-hmm. I'm actually showing and 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 you know really giving the reader that inside of again these five children living as children because they were still still children and they still yeah. wanted to enjoy life, have fun, and do some things. So that's also included in the book, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, along with, you know, as I said, the the um, kind of heart-wrenching piece of what my what the mother is going through. And at the same time she's going through, they're living as kids, as you said. We're moving along. We're just doing what we have to do from day to day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you, so I, you know, I present both, both okay. sides. Yeah, that's a great. I'm glad that you show both sides because it's good to see both sides of of. Of in um 
I can't think of the word I want to say. What is the word I want to say? You know, it's just you. Mm, I can't think of words. <laughs> but I, 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 I kind of get what you're saying because it's so nice because, because yes, it was a, a, a sad period of disruption and, and, a, and a tragedy. But as you're going through life, you know, bad things happen, but but good things are happening, and you're still trying to progress. You know, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. so you have to um, actually explore, and you have to show that to people that it's not it's not all. It's not all, you know, just beaten down and downtrodden, that Mm -hmm. even in the midst of a destruction or a bad time, um, there's good happening, and you have to find that good, you know, and smile sometimes, you know? Yeah. I found my word triumph over the the hurdles that you got to go through. You still can triumph. Over that, and yeah, and you, you, you know, you you triumph as an eight eight year old, and you triumph as a as a mother trying to make a better life for her children, and that's right. what we want as a parent. Is a bet. We I always tell my kids, I want you to have three times better than, or four times better than what I had. Exactly. You know? and, and they'd be looking at me like, what? <laughs> but exactly. as a parent, that's what we want. We want the best for our kids. And your mother, she she could have stayed there and probably and, and waddled in her pain and. And, and, and went downhill, you know, from that. And maybe even lost her children because she just went downhill. Right. And she said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I know I can be better. I can do better for my children. It's going to, it's going to be a sacrificing some things. And as a parent, we always sacrifice some. We, maybe we, we don't get nothing to eat, but they, the kids all eat. You know, you're always sacrificing something for your child to have a exactly. better life. And I, I think that is so, so wonderful. I, I'm, I'm so excited to read this book. I'm going to be reading it on my on my trip. <laughs> I, I, well, thank you, thank I, you. I love a good story, and I, I, you know, and I just think it's going to be a great story. All right, so I haven't even asked you any questions on interview. We just, I just been enjoying this. <laughs> um, what is the biggest surprise that you experienced after you became a writer? Um, the biggest, I guess, the biggest surprise to me is I am. I am by nature, I am an introvert, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, I, and, 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 I'm, and I'm very quiet. And really the biggest surprise to me was to say that, you know, having, and, and you know, because I've seen all the promotions of you, that you have to go out and you have to speak to people and speak about your book and, um, you know, and market, et cetera, and that I've actually – found that as introverted as I am, that I've enjoyed speaking to people and enjoyed getting to, to know and meet different people. So that really, I think, has also been a great, good outcome for me writing this book. I think you're the first person that has ever said that. That's good. <laughs> Most people, <laughs> they're introverts. They, they don't like the promoting side at all. They're like, nah, that's okay. But I think, like I tell my clients all the time, you have to find the stuff that you like to do. I think right. that when writers, what they do is they do what everybody else is doing, but that <laughs> might not be – you have to find your promotion niche just like you have to find your writing niche. You have to find what works for you. You know, some people can jam on social media, and some people social media intimidates the heck out of them, and they hate it. They don't want to be on there. You know, I was talking to one of my clients today, and she was talking about that she didn't – that she does so much on social media and then she doesn't get the engagement that she wants that she should get on the social media. And I told her, I said, sometimes just because somebody else is using it, does that, that doesn't mean there's something for you. She gets a lot of her work from word of mouth. And exactly. so she don't really need social media. If, and that's what you have to look at. What are the results that you're getting from what you're doing? You know, if you're getting lots of crickets and you're spending two and three hours a day doing this and nothing, and the results are the – now, you got to look at – give yourself – I always say give yourself three months on any of the, these things that you're trying because then mm-hmm. you can see if it works. You can't see if something worked in one week. Now nobody see you in one week. Right, <laughs> you know? right. If you've done it for three months and you say, okay, uh, I'm still getting crickets. What do I do? Move on. Don't keep doing that. You know, don't keep doing that. Move on. And I've, I told her, I said, you're not missing anything on social media. Are you missing anything? <laughs> if you felt like you were getting crickets, and but you're still getting people are still coming to you to work with you, then you're okay. Now, if you if nobody's coming to you, then you got to do something. What are you What are you going to do? 
you know, if you're not selling any books at all, then you got to find something else to promote yourself. You either got to be going to And that's great the advice. Game. That's great advice. And I, I'm listening to you and saying, hey, yeah. she's telling me something. I'm, I'm taking that in. <laughs> well, people do what they don't like to do. And when you do stuff that you don't like to do, guess what you do? You don't do it. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I don't like social media. I don't like getting on there. I love social media. I love talking to people on Facebook. I'm on Clubhouse now. I, oh, my goodness. That's my favorite thing today. Clubhouse <laughs> shut down on us. We all were sick. Now, Facebook shut down a couple of weeks ago, and we were all, they were all upset. I wasn't upset because I had other platforms to go to. <laughs> <laughs> but when Clubhouse went down, I, I didn't go to the other platforms. I was sad. I was like, Whoa. I felt like the Facebook people felt. <laughs> I <was> like, oh. <laughs> Because I like it. I enjoy doing it. I have fun on there. I'm talking to people. I'm making money. When you're making money and you're having fun, you do things. Hey, you, that sounds good to me. If the PayPal is not ringing and you're having a horrible time, you're like, why am I doing this again? What? Right. Why am I putting hey. out books and nobody buying them? Why? Right. Well, let's go find the fun stuff. I love doing podcasts. It's fun. I enjoy. Look, I'm enjoying talking to you. We're talking about your wonderful book. That's <laughs> fun. If I got over here and you be, and I'm like, girl, I wish she, she hurry up. Hey, I'm ready to get out of here. <laughs> that's, that's not a fun podcast. I, no, I no, that, no, know. that's not. No. But yeah, as I said, nice I heard what you said, and really, you are telling me something, making me really think about it, because it's true. I'm not a big social media and a, mm -hmm. a person, and, and I'm not, and, I, and so I've been, like, staying away, and I was kind of feeling bad for not doing it, mm -hmm. but... Like I said, like the podcast and interviewing with people that I've been enjoying, and you just really cleared it up for me. Keep doing those things that I'm enjoying, you know? Yes, yes, <laughs> because so many of us do the stuff we don't like, and then then we get burnt out and we pissed off. We right. <laughs> you, 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 look, I have clients go, and nobody talks to me like they talk to you, LaShawn, on social media. Well, I said, well, I, 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 I always give the assignment to um, – my dog would lose his. I thought, Seriously, Snoop? I, um, I, I give the assignment of writing, to write down 31 questions that you want to ask your readers. And every day you ask a question to your readers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and people are, that doesn't work. I've been doing that for five or six years. It works. I ask questions. Uh, if you follow me, I ask. Yeah, you do. You do because. And, 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 and then they get the conversation. I, I, I asked them the other day about Crocs. Do you wear Crocs? Man, I didn't think anybody was going to respond. Anybody, oh, some people love Crocs. I don't ride Crocs. People put <laughs> their little pictures on there and they look Crocs. I was like, okay. The, the, thing, <laughs> the thing is about starting a conversation. Um, social media is about conversation. What kind of conversations are you having on social media? If you're on Twitter, you're talking to people. If you're on Facebook, you're talking to people. Even LinkedIn, you're talking to people. You're always talking to people. So what are, what are you having conversations about? If you're a person who don't like to talk, then you're going to have a hard time on social media because you're not having conversations. You right. don't want to do that. You know, you, I talk to people all the time. Say, I don't talk on the phone. I don't like talking on the phone. I don't, like, I don't really care for talking on the phone, but Clubhouse is like talking on the phone. <laughs> And I'd be on there every day talking. And I'm like, now how? I like to talk. Now that's a difference. Talking on the phone is different from liking to talk. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And so yeah. You, I always tell my clients, find the stuff that you like to do. It's going to take you a while, a little minute. You're not going to, unless you already know. You know, I have people that tell me I don't do podcasts because I don't like to talk. I don't like the way my voice sounds. Okay. So what else are you going to do? I had a client that didn't want to do promotion. She didn't want to do promotion. I was teaching her how to promote. She didn't want to teach. She didn't want to learn how to promote. She said, I, I don't like to do that. That's too much. It's too stressful. Okay. So I said, all right, if you're not going to promote yourself, then you have to pay somebody to promote you because you, what are you going to be? Are you going to go to events? She said she didn't want to go to events. Then finally she said she came back and she said, LaShonda, I don't care that I'm not selling books. I write because I like to write. I love my story. If somebody buys it, then I'm okay. I'm happy. But I don't have to sell books. And I told her, I said, then that's what you need to know. You need yeah. to know what is it that you want from your book. That's very important. Most people, when you talk to them, I want to be a New York bestseller author. 
Okay, so here's what's your plan for getting there? Plan. Right. Yeah. You need a plan to get you it, that. It do. You it do. You say, I want to sell 5,000 books. Do you know 5,000 people? I know 200, then you got to get the rest. Exactly. So, so you got to have a plan for what is it that you want. When she told me that she didn't want to sell books, she just want to write books, I told her, if that makes you happy, you're okay with that, do that. Nobody says you got to sell books. Nobody right. says that. You, I wrote eight books. I haven't sold them yet. I haven't got out of my cur- my closet to put them out there. But when I do, I want them to sell. I do not <laughs> want them to sit in the closet anymore. I want people to read them. That's my goal. I want I want to have readers years from now say, man, I still read Lashonda's books and they're 100 years old. That's my dream. I right. want to be like Laura Inga Wilder. People still reading her books. Read yeah. uh, Jane Austen. That's me. I want to be on that list. That's my dream. I want to be on that list. People, I want to sell lots of books. I do want to sell lots of books, but I want to be on that list 200 years later. LaShonda's books were fantastic. We still reading them. That's right. What I, so I know that it's going to take a long time to get to that point because I got, I got to get to all the readers. I got to get to the readers. You know, I got a plan for that, though. I'm going to be in all the libraries. That's my dream. Hey, that's how I found Laura Ingalls. That's how I found Jane Austen. The library, I know. <laughs> that's how you stay for years and years and years, in the library. In the, Exactly, in the library. In the library. They got a book in there for hundreds of years in the library. So I know what my what my plan is to get in, to get, I want to be a New York best-selling author in the library. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. That's my dream. But I know what I got to do to get to that dream. You got to know what you want for your book. You got to know what you're going to do to get to that dream. You can you can promote on social media and not sell one book because That's you're not true. getting in front of the right person. The right person. I'm, I'm going to give you one more example, then I got a question for you. So I decided that I was going to do Ken DeVella. I mm-hmm. heard Ken DeVella. And yeah. so... And um, with any platform, I know it's going to be hard because you got to bring people to that platform. What okay. I learned that I've learned in, since June, July is that there are different readers. So there are readers who love a good book. They want it in print form. They don't want to read it any other way but in a print mm-hmm. book. There are readers who are really love ebooks. They they you know stop buying print. They just buy ebooks. They love ebooks. They love reading on the apps or the Kindle. There are people who love audio books. They love them. They love them so much that's the only way they read books. If it's not in audio, then they won't be reading. Mm. Then there is a group of people who love what I'm right now, Ken Devell. They love having a book that. It's like a it's like a TV show. Every every week they got a new episode that they can read. It's short mm. episode, you know, they can read it at lunchtime and then they can come back next week and read the next thing. They love that. And then it's that group of people who love all kinds of books. They can do either one. They can stretch they can do audio, they can do books, they can do uh, audio and they can do ebooks. They can do all all four of the books. They they love them that way. Mm. What I've learned is when you're when you are talking to the reader, you need to know which reader you're talking to. Yes, that is so important. I just I just learned that this year. That makes because, perfect sense, though. Yeah, because the people that write Ken Vella are talking to the book readers who want the book, and they and the book readers are telling them they're saying, "I'll wait till the book comes out. When the book goes out in print, or you put it on ebook." I buy it. I wait. Mm-hmm. Because you have to finish the book and then that you can print it. So they're saying mm-hmm. that to them. All these authors are getting that. And I found that that's the wrong audience. That's not the reader that you're trying to pitch to. I was mm-hmm. the same way. I, my, book, my book is called um, Building Your Readership. It's for authors. It's for writers mm-hmm. who want to learn how to build their readership. But I thought because it's for authors that authors would come over to the platform and read it. Again, I did not look at who the readers were. Ah. So if I'm pitching to an author who likes a print book or who likes an e-book, they ain't coming over to that platform. I'm not doing that. I don't want to read nothing on no on that platform, or I don't want to read it on my app. I want the whole book. True. That, that is not my audience. And so this week, I, last week, I realized that. I was like, oh, my goodness. 
we got to go find the people who like to read like that, who like that episode by episode thing. So mm-hmm. now I'm on a mission to find those authors because there's some out there, some because I've I've gotten people reading my book. They're reading it. I just got to find more people, you know. Okay. And so, um, so that is something that you have to look at when you're when you're a writer. You know, you decide. Okay, I want you decide you want an audio book. Does your does your reader want an audio book or do you want an audio book? You know, and audio books cost a lot of money to invest in. And if you don't have the readers that, because re- most people don't like audiobooks. I didn't know that until I started reading them, you know, and talking about it more. And I was like, oh, I love this. I, oh, I hate audiobooks. Somebody told me I was not reading because I was listening to an audiobook. You're listening to it. You're not reading it. It's not the same. How are you going to tell wow. me not the same? You don't even listen to audiobooks, so how are you going to tell me that I'm not enjoying the book because I'm not physically holding it? Right. <laughs> You know, but those are the book snobs, I call them. They're book snobs because they don't, <laughs> it's only certain ways. Yeah, it's book snobs are, they only want print or you only can have ebook. Or you, I'm like, I'm on a mall. Give me, every, every, I, give me all of my money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's how I look at it. Give me my audio money. Give me my print money. Give me my <laughs> ebook money. Now, look, I'm into now. Give me my serial money. No, don't play. Give me all of my money. I want all of it. And and the author, that's what you have to think about. How mm. you know, I know a lot of authors that they only do ebooks. They're not doing print at all. But you mm. do yourself this disservice because there's like I said, who is your reader? Does your reader want only ebooks? Some people right. want they want all three of them. I, I'm that per I'm that person. <laughs> if I find if I like I'm I talk about Beverly Jenkins all the time, but I buy Beverly Jenkins book. And then I buy the print, the ebook, and then I have the the audio book. So that's three books I have mm. because I I have I have a library, and then I have my books that I carry on an ebook. And then if I'm driving, I want to listen to it. So I got all three. You know that's another audio. jam. That's another good yeah. gem of information that you're <laughs> that you're sharing. <laughs> You have to know who your reader is. If you don't know who your reader is, you're going to have a hard time because you can't understand why they're not buying that print copy. When maybe your readers are me, 54, and can't get into the print because it's so tiny print. So I got to buy ebook. That's e-book, how I moved yeah. to ebook because I couldn't read the little tiny print no more. I was like, this is real. Even with the e read with the reading glasses, I was like, this is y'all getting a headache. I, uh, and, right. You know, I went to I went to Kindle and I can. Open it up a little more, bigger letters, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us have to, we don't have no choice. We have to go to the Kindle. I mean, Most you know, definitely. <laughs> right. So, but you need to know that. I did a see, and you do search, and that's why I ask questions, because those questions, I slide a little survey in there, and I find out. I, and that's how I found out that the people that follow me, they ain't into serial, into episode books. No, no. no. Did you go? I even asked, have y'all, have, any, have any of you been over to Kindleville and checked them out? Nope, don't have no plans to. I mean, with no problem. Nope, nope. I don't want to. Mm. No, I, I'd rather have the book. I wait till it come out. And then I've had people send me a message. LaShonda, girl, hurry up and finish the book so we can buy it. I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, right. You know, so. Uh, but that was good for me so I knew that. No, and no sense of me keep promoting over here. Y'all ain't bad. Y'all not coming. They're not gonna right, come over there. Right. So go find another place to promote. And that's the other. That's the other thing about promotion. Are you promoting on the right platform? Because yeah. those people they could care less. I got on TikTok. Boom. Everybody on TikTok like Kindavella. They won't know about Kindavella. They won't. You know. I was like, oh, okay. So where am I at? I'm on I'm on TikTok. Where am I at? I'm on Clubhouse because we are we're on Clubhouse. People are talking about Kindleville. About it. That's where I learned yeah. different things about it. I'm on Clubhouse. Be on the platform where the people that don't want to read the type of books that you that you're writing. You right. Know, uh, this was a this if doing Kindleville has really helped me improve my promotion, even helping me be able to help my clients improve their promotion because mm. when you know what your reader wants, now they, I always, I always don't know what the reader, what they like to read, but I didn't think about what do they want to read it as. Right. I never thought about that. And I was like, oh I, my gosh, 
That is so important because as a right, if you're an indie author, you need to know that because you're going to invest in stuff. You're going to invest in formatting. Do I need to format just for ebooks or do I need to format for ebooks and print books? Do I right. need to do audio books? Because everybody and my people, that's all they keep talking about. Where's the audio book? Okay, I need to make some money so I can get this audio book set up. You know, right. if you if you're, you know, I tell one of my clients, if your has your audience said you they want an audio book or do you want an audio book? And she said, huh? <laughs> she <laughs> thought about that. She wanted the audio book because she loved audio. I love, I love, love audio books with a passion. That is my favorite way to read. Mm. But nobody in the whole six years that I've had my book out here has said, LaShonda, are you going to make this into the audio book? Nobody. Okay. I have not said that other I've had people ask me if I do the audio, would I read it? And I was like, nah, I don't want to read it. And they're like, you should read it. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't want to read it. You should read it. But nobody has said, LaShonda, when is your audio book coming out? Nobody. So you. So so should I pr- do it because I want it, or should I? Mm, you know, when I get some right. No, but that's like that, that's good. That that is a lot of good um, information and things to to think about as an author in terms of your mm-hmm. audience and where they are, where to find them. Just not you know what subject matter what they like to read, but like you said, how they want to read it mm-hmm. or hear it or whatever. Yeah, because when you're an indie author, you need to know all this information because that helps you with uh, how you're going to publish your book. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you're going, okay, maybe I have a, I have a client that um, her audience are print books. And then right. one, year, one, one year she decided that she was go- uh, the print book wasn't going the right way, the formatting wasn't going the way she wanted it to, so she released the e-book. Man, her readers was hot. They were like, mm. oh, why are you putting out the ebook first? What? Mm. And she's like, they mad at me. I said, they supposed to be mad at you. And she said, why? I said, because they are your readers. Ebook right. is second. It don't, they always, I said, you go with what, what sells first. The, mm-hmm. the, the print book sells phenomenal. She sells so many print books. Mm. Very rare she sells a lot of ebooks. Uh, so okay. why would you put out the ebook first? And then your 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 sales are down. I know. So, you know, everybody buying my books. No, they waiting on the print book. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you have to take that in consideration, you know. And so hopefully, I know going forward, this has really helped me because I'm like, okay, what do I want to invest in? What is it that you want to invest in? You know, um, you know, you driving yourself crazy, and you, you just, you know, do you just want to? Do they just? Are your readers just reading ebooks? I found that my followers. Read ebooks and audiobooks in um, print. They like that. They, they don't uh-huh. like serialize it at all. They're like, no, no, no thank you. <laughs> so, okay, I'm okay with that. I needed to know that though because I'm like, why? I got 10,000 plus followers. How come ain't nobody coming over here reading this book? <laughs> right. Well, they don't want to. They don't even want to go on a platform. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, Mm-hmm. But I, that was good for me to know. That was good for me to know that I needed to go. I ne- now I need to go and find other people. I right. I, I, my community does not want what I have to offer. Now I got to go find a new community, and I'm hey, okay with that. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have a hard time with that because they think that their community is supposed to support them. Just because you have a community does not mean that they will support you. I did, and that's, that's, you that's, that's a gr- great thing to learn up front. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you don't want to have 5,000 people following you and two people bought the book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you, 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 I see people do that all the time. They build this community on these social media platforms. They don't have nothing to do. They're, this is what they do. Follow me. You follow me. I follow you. You follow me. I follow you. Now, people, when you do that, you, you, you take up space for the people who need exactly. to be following you. Exactly. You know, I'm real picky on who I follow. I don't do no follow for follow. Unless mm-hmm. no. they're author, if they're a reader, if they say they're, if I go to their, their page and it says they, they, I see they like books and stuff like that, yep, I'm a follow. But right. if I don't see no books on your stuff, no, nah, I'm going to leave no. you. Unless you got to, here's the, here's the exception, food people. I love, I love food stuff. So I, yeah, I'm following. <laughs> <laughs> food and movies, then you, I get, you get <laughs> If you ain't talking about 
no books on your page, and you don't got to be an author, but if you ain't said none, not I look at all your pictures, none of them talk about books. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it right. Busy. No, no, now I'm you, with. You know, and you have to be real selective when you when you're building your community because you want to build your community who wants to hear from you, not not. Oh, I got five thousand people. No, no, right. No, you don't want five thousand people. You want five thousand readers. Exactly. <laughs> there is a difference, and a lot of people. I found that the I found that out the hard way because when I got on social media in two thousand and nine, there was no rules. We was following everybody. You just follow uh, everybody. People were following me because I did book promotion. So they was like, hey, she do book promotion. She, I'm an author. When I book come out, okay. I do her. She's going to help me, you know. And so that's how I got the, I started, my stuff started growing. Because I had stopped following people. People were following me. They following me. They following me. And I was like, and so I started, that's when I started asking, asking questions. Because I was like, well, who is following me? Am I, do I have readers? Do I have writers? Do I have authors or do I have family members? Okay. And I found out that I had authors, I had writers, very, very small section of readers, and then my family. Okay. And so as an author who writes for writers, that's good. But mm. as an author who writes fiction, that wasn't very good. Right. And so I said, oh, man, I got to build a community somewhere else. And so mm. I've been building my Instagram, trying to build my Instagram up about me and my writing and stuff like that because I need to reach readers. Mm -hmm. People who buy books. I, I love my writers. I do. I love my authors. I do. But mm -hmm. they ain't trying to buy your book. They want you to buy theirs. <laughs> exactly. No, you, you're correct. You're correct. Yeah, you know, I ain't trying to be hateful or nothing, but that's just no. how it works. No, <laughs> that's reality. Right, we we ain't trying to buy your books. We we want you to write buy our books. Exactly, <laughs> you know? that's reality. And so, and so you got to know who is in your community, and it's and it's a and then I tell my clients that all the time. That's what the questions come in. You just you doing a survey on a slide. You just asking one question at a time instead of doing a ten ten survey thing, ten question thing. You just you ask ten questions for the whole week, but one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you when you do when you do a survey, you get zip. Nobody answers nothing. But if you do that one at a you write that write, write down what you what do you like? What do you read? What do you know, those little questions and right. then you go back and you look at it. If you got crickets on that one, then you like, okay, they don't they don't like mysteries at all. They, mm -hmm. Do they like memoir? No. Mm -hmm. Do they like fictionalized memoir? Yeah. So you you know, you asking these little mini questions and finally somebody, you know, and you get and you can see who is in your audience because you'll be like Okay, and then you can say, you can start talking about your book to those people. You can call people's names out. Hey, Beth, uh, I saw you like so-and-so. What you think about this little snippet right here? Right. You, know, you can ask different questions and stuff and get feedback. I get feedback, oh, my goodness, from my writing stuff all the time. I'll ask about, I, I ask about what if you had to go to another planet? Would you go? You know, most of people say no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting conversation, you know. Yeah. You, you can ask different questions. You you got a great question. Would you leave your kids and move to another country? Right. That yeah. that right there starts the whole conversation because then they're gonna be like, Who did that? And then you can talk give them a little snippet. Oh, my mother had to do that for us. What? Then they wanna know more. This what girl, you got some good stuff you can share. <laughs> Oh, you're, you know, you know what you're you you're great at. It. I have to say you're great at what you do because what I'm what I'm getting here is an education of a <laughs> lot of different ways, as you say, to find readers, but also to mm -hmm. just like um how do you say kind of um massage them and you know get them yeah. involved and and and, yeah. and grow. Yeah, that's engagement. We don't engagement. Do the engagement. There you go. You you that's the right buy word. My book, buy my book. And you have to do the engagement. You got to get to know people. You got people like you're sharing your grandson on a page. I am proud of my grandson. Now you yeah. want to share your kids? That's on you. But this little baby right here, I want everybody to see every smile that I see. <laughs> That's just me. That's just. But you got to know what you feel comfortable sharing on. Yeah. You got a story that is going to break people's hearts because they 
They, you got a story that's going to make people cry. You got a story that's going to inspire other people. But unless you tell them about it, they ain't going to never know what's out there. When did right. you publish this book? When did you publish this book? I published the book in June. In June. Okay. So, okay. You you are new new author out here trying to get this yeah. stuff out here. And so, this podcast will hopefully introduce people to to it. You know, you share it to your community. Share this podcast to your community so they can hear your story because you have a wonderful story. You all, you all triumph over something. You know, you didn't let grief pull you down. You guys triumph over that. And that's mm-hmm. important because there's so many people. Every day I'm giving condolences to somebody. Every yeah. day. It used to be maybe once a month. I, that was one of the things I used to tell people. Say there's three things you could do on Facebook that you're going to do every day. Tell somebody happy birthday. Tell, uh, congratulate somebody on something. And then you're going to send a condolences. And right. that used to be maybe every once a month. I am probably do a condolences every day. Wow. Just, just COVID has hit. You know, and people's parents are dying. You know, mm-hmm. Somebody's brother died the other day. And I'm like, oh. Well, I have experienced that. I've, I've lost my parents. I've mm-hmm. lost two siblings. I've lost cousins. I just last year I lost uncles and aunts. I've lost everything, and so I I understand that feeling, and it's horrible. It's a horrible experience. Right. You know? And when you have not been touched by death, I I think you a, a blessed soul that is so wonderful. But everybody, most of if you didn't lost somebody. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and this, this is your dog. My friend lost her dog, and she was devastated. Oh, of, of course. I can understand I, I that. I feel that because I've lost dogs. I, mm-hmm. I had a dog that died, and, I mean, I was devastated. I couldn't go to work. They was like, you ain't coming to work because your dog died? Look, until <laughs> you experience your dog dying, don't talk to me because you don't know. You don't exactly. Know that you don't know that. Yeah. He's your family member. He is a family <laughs> member. He died. Right. It, it, he wasn't even my dog. Our dog wasn't wasn't sick. He got hit by a car. So that oh, was wow. devastating. You know. So don't tell me I can't feel I can't grieve my dog. Oh you know? wow. You know, but people don't understand, and this is no. your book will help people understand that that side that they have never experienced, and that's and that's the good thing about writing. Sometimes it takes people to places they have never been, and they get to it, empathize with that person. It, you say, right, oh, wow. and get, and I think also to do it, it gets people to to open up because sometimes mm-hmm. people have been through experiences and they're holding it inside, you know, yep. And, yep. and it gets them to say, hey, just like you said, empathize. Someone else has gone through it, so they kind of feel like a community, and then now they can open mm-hmm. up and get it out, and it helps them to move on. It does. It does. That's what. I, when my mom died, I started talking about grief because nobody talked about it. And nobody told you how you were going to feel or what to do. And I felt horrible. I felt horrible. I didn't want to get out the bed some days, you know. And so I started blogging about it. I'm like, this, is, this sucks. I'm mad. I'm pissed. And so mm. I started doing research on it. And I was like, it was different stages that you go through. And, you know, and you're mad. You're depressed. Yeah, I didn't even know I was depressed. I did not know I was depressed because I've never been depressed in my life. I wow. found out two years later that what I was laying on the couch every day was depressed. I was in the depressed state of mind. I, yeah. it, I said I was a, I called it, I was a, I said I was a walking zombie. I, at that oh, time I was dude. just a walking yeah. dead. And I said, I was a walking zombie. And he said, what do you mean? I was like, I, wa- I went to work. I sat in my cubicle. I didn't talk to people. I listened to music in my cubicle and I cried every day. I cried in my cubicle. I mm. cried in my and then I came home, I cooked dinner, and I laid on the couch and watched TV. And if it made me cry, it was great because I could cry. And nobody mm. was I'm watching TV, but I was letting loose of my grief. So oh, two wow. Years, two years I did that. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to see. I was depressed. I didn't even know I was depressed. Was depressed, I'm right. I'm a go-lucky person. I didn't know what saved me was writing about my grief and talking to a Another person who was going through her grief with her mom dying. We talked and we, we we got all those feelings out. And I tell people now, go to grief counseling, go to grief supports because you need to talk about it. You got to get that right. out of your system because when you leave it in there, that's when the depression comes. That's when right. you start doing drugs, you're doing drinking, yeah. you're going crazy because you want that 
it's the I call it a deep pain that it it it, it never goes away, but you can cover it a little right. bit. Yeah. But, but there you don't go. nobody tell you that pain is that you're gonna feel that deep pain and it's horrible. You know, and so that's why I talk about it because I want other people to feel they're not alone, that you don't have to sit on your couch for two you can sit on it for a couple right. of days but get up and do things. Don't yeah. sit on that couch like I did for two two years, depressed, missing my mama, crying because I'm missing my best friend. No, my and my mother's saying was just keep on living, and that's what got me up every day. I would hear her whisper that to me, just keep on living, Lashonda, just keep on living, and that helped me. And so that's what I share with people: just keep on living because it's hard. It's hard, and this this world is hard. And if you got to add grief onto this world. Oh my goodness! Right. No, it's it's, well, Jacqueline, it's tough. I have so enjoyed talking to you, girl. This was look. You held your own. Go on with your bad self. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take you one note. This was really great talking to you. Like I said, I do follow you on Facebook, and I see all your stuff, and I'm like, you're right. You are a social butterfly, which is I told you, <laughs> I am not. <laughs> and so, um, your stuff really encouraged on, me, and I got a lot you. from you out of this interview and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here and you have popped out of the cocoon so you all you're doing now is working on showcasing your butterfly wings now. You can't say you're not a social butterfly. Once you talk to me you become a social butterfly. You, 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 <laughs> okay. You, you join the movement. <laughs> I'm in the I movement. Let, I, can't, I can't let you go back into the cocoon. You can't Good. Podcast, I want to go, go back. First. You know, Let everybody see your wings so it's too late. You can't go back. <laughs> Well, tell us, Jacqueline, how we can reach you offline. Uh, well, online, rather. How can readers uh, this find you online? Okay, I'm on Facebook at um, Jackie Walker Pat, and I have a website, um, writingsbyjackie.com. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, tell us the title of your book again. A Season of Disruption. All right, so that will be in the show notes, people. Make sure you get you a copy of that book because it sounds so good. I can't wait to read it. Um, I would like to thank our guest for sharing with us today. I hope what she shared was helpful for you. I want to thank our sponsor, Building Your Readership by LaShonda Hoffman. Please check the show notes for the link to the purchase. Go over there to Kindervella and check it out. If you've never been on Kindervella, Check it out. Believe me, there are some really good stories on there, really good stories. Try something new with your reading. Just because you read a book or an e-book on audio, try an episode book. I'm telling you, you're going to get hooked. I, I'm, I'm reading about six or seven books over there already. Check them out. Believe me, you, you will come back and say, LaShonda, why are you send me to that platform? I spent all my money. <laughs> I want to thank our listeners for taking time to listen to the podcast. I have your three questions for you. Did you learn something from this episode? If you did, please share the podcast with your community. Number two, would you like to be a guest for an episode? Contact me at onestormaggmail.com. I will be scheduling for next year, 2022. So look me up. One last question. Have you promoted your book or business today? If you have not, please go showcase those wings. Somebody needs what you have to offer. This is LaShonda Hoffman, and you know what? I will see you on the next. Recorded. Recorded. Ah,